All right, I think we got the stadium filled here and we've got a pretty packed agenda. So why don't we begin? Good, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Brad Long, Managing Partner and Chief Investment Officer here at Fiducian Advisors. I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Rob Lowry, an Associate uh, Research Director and member of our Global Public Markets team. So we have a packed agenda. We have 30 minutes to get through our mid-year update. I'll give you two kind of administrative items and then we'll move on uh, quickly and get to the good stuff. First, if you have questions, ask them throughout, put them in the chat window. We'll try to get to them on the fly. If we don't, or you think of something right after and you think, shoot, I missed my window, just send us an email, send your consultant an email. We'll get to your question, no problem. Second thing is following this presentation, we will be following up on Monday with a recording of this. So if you wanted to hit pause, but you couldn't, you will be able to ne next week. We'll also be providing the written version of this uh, content, which today we're going to go about to two thirds of it. Uh, so you'll see it, this and more with our written content next week. So if that's of interest to you, uh, that's coming shortly. So with that said, uh, why don't we jump into our mid-year outlook? Because we've got a lot to cover in 30 minutes. First, coming into 2024, three themes we thought we'd be primarily influencing markets. So first, messy middle of inflation. So still moving in the right direction towards the Fed's target of 2%. It would probably be a rocky road, right? It would not just be a linear step down to 2%. Well, and guess what? That is exactly how 2024 has played out. And we'll get into that in greater detail in just a second. Our second primary theme was prepare, not predict. This is as much a nod to the 2023 recession prognosticators that said a recession is all but assured. It's almost a guarantee and not that we like to use that word in, in, in this market. Uh, certainly it was not. 2023 was not a recession. And here we sit in the middle uh, of 2024 with a fairly robust economy. Two primary things from that. One, we don't think uh, predicting either markets or recession is a very uh, helpful tool. We often get it wrong. We and frankly, everyone else. And two is we don't have to predict. We should prepare, right? Recessions are inevitable. Uh, and we know that. But with recharged rates, which we'll get into in a moment, we think we can build resiliency and prepare for inevitability rather than trying to predict it. The third theme we thought would be driving markets and prices this year is a deal around concentrated consequences. A handful of stocks driving the vast majority of the return here in the United States. Um, and what are the impacts of that, which we're going to get into in greater detail in just a moment and how that's unfolding in 2024 and frankly, what we think that means for portfolios going forward. So what's the uh, what's a scorecard on that for 2024? Well, it's a it's a bit of a mixed bag. Uh, so starting here on the left side with dark blue bars, uh, that's fixed income assets. Now remember, entering 2024, the market uh, had its expectations or hopes really on a March rate cut, and guess what? It's July and we haven't seen a rate cut. Expectations have moved to September. We're going to get into that in greater detail. But because of that, longer duration assets have underperformed shorter duration assets. So we'll get to, to that in greater detail in just a moment. Getting into the green middle of the page here, that uh, Mount Everest looking bar chart in the middle that says 14%, that's large cap US stocks. That return is materially influenced by a small handful of securities that have done extraordinarily well, we call it things like Nvidia up well over 100% year to date, you know, driving that level of return. Now, if your eyes move a little bit to the right, you see that bar that says emerging markets at a piddly 7.5%. Frankly, if it was mid-year and you didn't have that uh, bar to the left, seven and a half through mid-year would be a pretty uh, successful rate of return, but it seems to pale in comparison uh, you know, to the concentration that we've seen here in the benefit in the US. And we're gonna spend a lot of time on that in just a moment. And then as we move further right here, we're seeing real assets, some of those comments around inflation, you know, commodities and hedge funds, which we'll actually get into uh, in a little bit. So we're going to delve into a lot of these concepts, frankly, what's driving them, what it means for our portfolio and why, uh, you know, we should be allocating the way we're allocated today. We're going to start with a bit of an economic backdrop and give a little bit of sense of where we sit today. Hey, Rob, you're on mute. If we zoom out on the overall economy, you know, the U.S. GDP grew 1.4% in the first quarter. So it's been pretty resilient so far year to date. It's a bit down from previous quarters. Um, and the labor market continues to be strong as well. But 
you know, there are signs in, of starting to show cracks and, you know, things that are showing us warning signs. We've got PMIs moving below 50 for both manufacturing and services for the first time in over a year. That below 50 line indicating contraction for those areas. And then while the labor market is strong at, you know, 4.1% unemployment rate, it has ticked higher and it has moved above the 12 month moving average. Now these indicators aren't perfectly predictable recession indicators by any means, and we're not trying to say that, but they have coincided with periods of economic weakness in the past. Additionally, we've seen the consumer start to show signs of slowing as well. Consumer spending is a bit down. Consumer delinquencies for credit cards and autos are up as well. And the leading economic indicator index is still trending negative year over year. Now, we're not trying to predict a recession by any means, and we saw that was pretty much impossible to do and no one got it right in 2023. But we do acknowledge that there is uncertainty in the market and the economy. And that as we you know, prepare for the inevitable recession, whenever it may happen, we think building resiliency into the portfolio makes sense. If we think about inflation, Brad alluded to it a little bit at the beginning, but you know, expectations of a March rate cut came off the table as inflation prints were above expectations for the first few months of the year. Since then, though, we've seen a, a bit rosier picture on the inflation front continuing to trend down. Um, the core PCE, the Fed's preferred measure of inflation, hit 2.6% in Mar uh, May of 2024, the lowest since March of 2021. If we look at the other market main indicator for inflation, core CPI, that sits at about 3.3% today, so a little bit higher than core PCE, and there's some differences between the two. But the shelter component of PC, PCI or core P, CPI, sorry, um, has really been a driver of that. And if we remove the shelter component, CPI sits at 1.8%, so below the Fed's target of 2%. And since July of last year, it's been X shelter, CPI X shelter has been below 2.5%. So we've made pretty good progress on the inflation front. And we think that opens the door for the Fed to cut um, in the future. And as Brad said, right, the market's now implying a 85% probability of a 25 basis point cut, their first cut in September. So it's important to think about, you know, as we try to build portfolios and get a sense of where to go, I would say the first thing is uh, there's a big difference between timing interest rates and having a view on their long-term direction. We're very much advocating the latter and not the former. And the way that we would do that is, you can think about the crosshairs of economic growth and inflation, right? This X, Y axis. So Y axis here, uh, higher on that uh, lens, you've got greater economic growth, lower the opposite. X axis, inflation, higher moving right. So what is the reaction function of the Fed uh, interaction to market conditions where you have, let's say, higher economic growth and decelerating inflation? Well, this, is, this would be what's called the soft landing, right? Where you get modest uh, economic or modest cuts from the Fed, the economy continues to grow, uh, full employment, but stable or modest inflation rate. So they would try to be moving back towards kind of a neutral rate, but cautious not to stir uh, and reignite the animal spirits of inflation. Now, a hard landing, by contrast, would be bottom left here, where you get economic weakness, unemployment rising, and you get decelerating inflation. That's where the adage of the Fed uh, increases interest rates on an escalator and decreases them on an elevator, right? They're bigger cuts in support of, you know, one of their dual mandates, which is full employment. Uh, so that's where you'd see a much more aggressive move from the Fed. Now, bottom right is where the Fed does not want to be, where you get accelerating inflation and economic weakness. That would be stagflation. Hopefully not a scenario we have to deal with in a material way. But, you know, the Fed in recent history uh, has tended to show a preference towards labor over prices, meaning people and employment. And so even in that type of environment where you have you know, higher inflation but economic weakness, there's a chance that either the Fed could hold or even cut modestly. Now, the only scenario we see that the Fed really kind of gets back on the rate high course uh, is if you get material economic growth. I promise we do pay the power bill, but that's just fine. Um, you get material economic growth and accelerating inflation. Then the Fed really does have to kind of step on the economic brakes, slow inflation, uh, and try to uh, really slow down uh, the economy. And so, as you can see, there's a lot of paths potentially lower and only a few paths higher. That is a pretty important inference on you know, the potential for asset classes and outcomes.
So let's explore that opportunity for fixed income a little bit deeper. We've seen a big shift in the market environment within fixed income over the last few years as rates have moved higher. And what it's offered is a nice positive asymmetry in the markets where, as indicated by the light blue bars, right, a move lower in interest rates provides a pretty compelling return on the fixed income front, especially for core fixed income. While the risk trade-off is, is pretty modest if interest rates move higher, as indicated by those dark blue bars. Now, if we think about Brad's discussion on the path of interest rates, um, multiple pathways lower, and we think the greater probability for the Fed to be moving lower in rates and higher, you know, the benefit of being right in this instance with this positive asymmetry is greater than the cost of being wrong. And we think that's a nice, fair risk reward trade off. Now, all things equal, if things if rates move sideways, you can see the green bars indicate current yield. There's pretty minimal opportunity cost for taking on that intermediate core fixed income position. You're not giving up much yield at all, um, but you do get that benefit of lower interest rates from a positive price return. Now, not all fixed incomes created equal. So I think it's important to high, highlight the high yield market here. What we're showing here is the spread of high yield above treasuries. So the compensation above the treasury yield that investors get to take on that credit and default risk. Historically, it's been at that blue line, about 470 basis points above treasuries. Currently today, it sits at 309. So tighter spreads means higher valuations. Valuations look rich. So the opportunity set um, going forward, we don't think is quite as attractive. But let's put that a little bit into perspective historically. As we think about average returns and um, if we're at that average spread level, poor looking returns are pretty positive, high single digits. And as spreads widen, the return opportunity gets better. That one's two, three standard deviation, et cetera. But today we're in that below average camp where the forward looking returns aren't quite as rosy as they are if you're at higher level spread levels. And that really has informed our underweight to high yield as we think about it compared to the core fixed income space. Now, you know, as we just went through, you know, we're talking a lot about fixed income and it's not just its outlook, but relative return. But we don't just own fixed income. So we have to talk about fixed income in context of the other things we own in the portfolio. So that's equity, real assets, alternatives. And, you know, as we noted, we have a, a a positive view on fixed income. Today, you can see here, our median expectation is a 10-year view of 5.9% on, on fixed income. Um, but there's volatility associated with that. Median, meaning kind of the middle of the road. So the higher the risk of the asset, the higher the variability around that expected return. And what this graph helps us do is translate that expected return as the variation of that return and over time. So the longer the time period, the smaller the variation, the shorter the time period, the wider the variation, as you would expect. So in any one given year, we would expect, you know, potentially an 18% return on fixed income or a 6.2% return on fixed income. Now, these are the bookends. These could certainly go higher, uh, but it gives us a sense of, you know, what's most likely in the return distribution. So now let's talk about how that compares to equity. So equity, U.S. large cap equity, we have a 6.8% expected median return over the next 10 years. Now look, there's a positive premium associated by owning equity versus fixed income. There absolutely is. But we need to recognize the variability or the risk in assuming that positive premium. As you can see here, on a 6.8% expected return, 34% or negative 20 in any one given year. So far more variability around that expected return. So it kind of is the juice worth the squeeze. Coming into 2024, right, we talked about uh, this relative difference. And for some clients, you know, offered the opportunity to shift into higher quality fixed income and still achieve return targets without or even reducing risk or maybe not taking on as much risk. Now, other clients may have chosen to stay where they were, but the important part is we are not lured into the idea of having more equity because we have in the past. Over the last decade or really 15 years, Investors have gone from 60-40 to 70-30 to 80-20, right, to chase returns as fixed income returns fell. We're in a different environment today, and that provides a different opportunity and a different trade-off between risk and return. So the key here is having intentionality around risks that are taken, not letting history just simply drive the bus on that relative allocation. And so we do think 
that there should be a thoughtful conversation about the level of risk relative to the return. Now let's get into equity. Today, you know, mid-year as of June 30th, the S&P trades at about 21 times forward price to earnings. So that compares to a 10-year average of about 17%. That's a fairly full valuation. You know, if you look at the graph here on the right, this is kind of bucketing the different tranches of uh, forward uh, price to earnings uh, since 1950 and looking at the forward return. And we sit in this bucket. Now we recognize that just because valuations are full, especially over a short period of time, it's not particularly predictive. 2024 is a great example of this. We started the year at fairly full valuations. It's actually very similar valuations is where we sit today. Yet the market has been up uh, quite considerably. So recognizing that you know, valuations in the short term aren't all that meaningful. But over the long term, it's harder and harder to have a higher expected return starting from full valuations. And that's why our US equity return stands at 6.8%, which is a fairly modest forward expectation. But that's not the whole story. Right? So if we break down the S&P and we look at the top 10 constituents, the top 10 constituents trade at 30 times forward earnings. That's a, a pretty material number. Now, their 10-year average is 20 times forward, and that's rightfully so. These have been businesses that have grown revenue and grown earnings at a more material rate uh, than many of their cohorts in the S&P, and so they command a higher price. But 30 times is a very full valuation. Now, if we look at the remaining stocks in the S&P 500, they trade around 18 times. Now, also above their 10-year average of about 16. So as we look at you know, kind of this pyramid of prices, if you will, you know, all trading at you know, fairly full valuations, but very different valuations. 30 times forward is a quite aggressive number. And, and we get a lot of questions around the Magnificent Seven and you know, high flyers like NVIDIA and others. And you know, I think it's a good enough time as any to try to build kind of historical context and maybe a word of caution. Um, you know, as we think about the MAG-7, and many have recent memory of other, uh, you know, uh, uh, materially uh, concentrated and driven markets like the tech bubble in the 1990s, or even, uh, you know, the benefit of emerging markets in the 2000s. You know, these are periods of time where a small cohort or maybe a region of stocks or sector of stocks uh, were the bell of the ball, right? But this is not the first time the market has played this trick. Right? We go back to the 1980s. It was Japan, the preeminent market without question or decision. 1970s, you know, we get into oil embargo, emerging markets and commodities. 1960s, it's the nifty 50s. Right, You get the point here. This is not uh, the first time we've been through this rodeo. And we as humans are conditioned you know, with behavioral biases to really extrapolate the recent into the future, because you know, if we think if you walk outside and it's hot, the next minute you presume it's going to be hot, right? Well, as we think about markets and we think about the future, oftentimes it is very different from what it is at present, and in sometimes it's different in ways that we couldn't even conceive at the time, right? Our brains are linear mechanisms, not exponential mechanisms, and we can't often see that far and with precision. And so we don't know when the tides will turn on, you know, the Mag Seven or AI or choose kind of your categorization of, of these fast moving stocks. But what we do recognize is that their preeminence uh, will not be forever. And that creates risk, it creates opportunity, uh, and it creates a need for thoughtfulness in how we derive uh, diversification and allocations in the portfolio. One of the ways we do that is through global allocations. Now, this is, this is not a new story. This is an old story, but we'll give you a bit of a new trick here. Um, valuations outside of the United States are materially less expensive than they are here in the United States. This is a relative line. So as the line is rising, uh, the S&P is outperforming and it has a higher valuation. Light blue is S&P versus emerging markets. Dark blue is S&P versus MSCI ETHs. Call it uh, Europe and a little bit more. Um, today, they're not just well above average, but they're either at or above kind of historical uh, norms. So if we look at uh, emerging markets, we have to go back to early 2003. If we look at EFI, we have to go back. I mean, it's an all-time high, but our next and most equivalent is back the GFC. So all else equal, like we've said before, valuations are a reasonable place to start, but they shouldn't be the end of the conversation. Should They should be the start of the conversation. And so as we look outside of just valuations and look at earnings, 
we see that there's some pretty material opportunities here outside the United States. Now, 2024 expectations were halfway through the year, so these aren't fully baked. So take them with a grain of salt, but expectations for emerging markets in 2024, you know, 18 versus 11 here in the US. 2025, it's a little, you know, outside of what analysts can probably reasonably predict, but call it a push or at least indifferent. So here today we sit with a called a 63% premium for earnings expectations in 2024 for growth, but yet a 20, about a 25% discount uh, from the average uh, valuations in emerging markets. So you know, in short, you're basically paying less and getting more, uh, which can be a compelling opportunity, not just from an absolute return perspective, but also diversifying some of those risks we just noted kind of in concentration in sectors. We expand on that valuation relationship to, to U.S. large cap a little bit more and shift it back to the U.S., the small cap picture looks very similar. Typically, small cap trades at about a 30% premium to U.S. large cap. You can see that blue line right in the middle of the page, averaging 1.3 times. But today, just the performance differential and valuation shifts, small cap's trading at about parity compared to U.S. large cap. Another, you know, another benefit for and an outlook for small cap. Additionally, earnings growth for small cap in similar fashion to international looks pretty attractive compared to large cap as well. Expectations for the back half of the year for Q3, small cap earnings growth expectations are 19% compared to 13% for US large cap. And for Q4, 24% versus 19%. So you're paying much cheaper prices for expected earnings growth that is, uh, that is higher than, than large cap. Additionally, if we think about um, the headwinds of interest rates that has impacted small cap a little bit more than large cap over recent years, if that shifts and we get the tailwind from declining interest rates, another feather in the cap for a small cap as that could benefit and be a nice tailwind going forward. We've gotten a lot of questions about inflation and you know, as we think about our messy middle where we think inflation is gonna be range bound and uncertain between that two and 5%, and we continue to think real assets have a place in portfolios. But let's dive a little bit deeper into the real estate portion of that. It's clearly garnered a lot of headlines over recent years. Um, and we acknowledge that there are risks and cracks within, um, mostly on the office side, and we'll get to that in a second. But we think about the overall fundamental picture of the real estate market. It's not as healthy as it was, say, five years ago, maybe. But you know, compared to the global financial crisis where the number of loans, uh, the number of loans with a loan to value ratio greater than one, right? So the loan is more than the building is worth, that negative equity or property is worth, is just significantly lower than what we saw in the GFC um, to, than it, it is today. It's much lower today than it was what we saw in GFC. But if we think about the real estate market, office gets all the headlines, um, but we want to make it clear that. Real estate doesn't equal office and office doesn't equal real estate, right? The real estate market is more than just the office buildings. Think about the private space. Office consists of only about 18% of the market. And it's even lower in the public space as well, consisting about 5% of the index. There's also other areas of the real estate market that are poised to potentially do well, right? If we think about data centers and cell towers, that craze of AI, right? You need data centers to harvest and house the um, servers to power all of that, right? That's part of that specialty bucket, which consists of 30% of the public market index for real estate. So there are opportunities within real estate, but we do acknowledge there are cracks and it will take time to work through. But um, having that diversified exposure, we think helps limit the downside of the office space. And maybe using public and private real estate is a, is a bridge here. A lot of our clients uh, are interested or invested in you know, the private market side of the business, private equity, private debt, private real estate. And we just covered some of the themes in private real estate, but we'll unpack kind of one of the key themes we think is impacting uh, both private equity and private debt today. Now, those of you that have kind of a shutter down your spine or worried about uh, you know, your accounting class from college, don't worry, we're not going to spend it too much time on this income statement. We want to give you an illustrative example of the impact of higher interest rates on both private equity and private debt. So let's look at this example here in which you have, call it 100 million in revenue from June 22 versus June 24. So you have margin of 50%, you have a cost associated with kind of the acquisition of those sales, 
and you have what's called EBITDA, earnings before keyword interest, uh, interest taxes, depreciation, and amortization. The I is the keyword there. So you got 30 left over. Now here's where it gets interesting, interest expense. So because of the move up in interest rates, so far, which is the new LIBOR, if that's a more familiar term, but it's the reference rate of which uh, you know, a floating rate loan will price off of. Well, that went from up fivefold, from one to over five. And now you've got an all-in rate of, you know, what used to be around six is now in the double digits. So you have a, an interest expense that's gone up by 76%. You have cash flow, right, which businesses are usually valued on, uh, that's down by about 40%, and an interest coverage ratio. So the kind of the coverage of the amount of paying in debt, the cash you have on hand, is down by over 40%. So the equity side, it's important to think about cash flow. Cash flow is two things. It's how you value a business, right? Discount the cash flows over time. And it's how you reinvest in a business. You take that cash flow, reinvest it back in the business, help grow the business organically. On the debt side, you can see, in the, even in the public markets, we observe a similar pattern here. So this is from Moody's looking at, you know, B minus issuers in the U.S. loan market. So again, floating rate loans. And B minus is fairly uh, analogous to kind of private equity issuers you know, that interest rate coverage has been falling pretty precipitously. Now for private debt uh, allocators out there, there's been a bit of a love uh, fest for private debt over the last few years, a lot of money moving in that direction. In some instances, that's very much warranted. However, I think there's been an underappreciation of the amount of risks, especially as interest rates have gone up, that has come through that space for lending to fairly levered small cap businesses um, you know, that are now being materially influenced by the increase in interest rates. So just like high yield, we want to make sure that the cost or, or the opportunity of return is relative to the commensurate level of risk uh, that we take in the portfolio. Now, it wouldn't be uh, a 2024 mid-year outlook if we didn't talk about the election, which we'll round out here. And then I know we had some questions come through and we'll try to get to in time. Um, we do want to talk about the election. We've written on this, so we'll try to get it too quickly, and we'll hit two things. The election's impact on the market and the market's impact on the election. First, elections are about promises, not about policies. So post-November, dust settles. We can talk about who's elected, the impact on tax and on international trade and potentially new laws. But what is said in a stump sheet uh, does not often make it into policy, right? So we need to discount that a little bit. But let's just do the raw numbers on election years. So since 1926, in general election years, markets are up 11.5%. If we stop right there, that's a pretty good number. Now, if you compare it to non-election years, that's a 12.4% return. So those naysayers that say, hey, election years are going to be tough, they're going to tell you the, the underperformance. But if you give me 11.5, I'd be happy all day. Now, if we look at just the percentage of positive returns in election years, again, a four-year cycle, 84% of the time we have returns above zero. That's a good number. Now, that's even better than non-election years, which is about 70%. And in 60% of those election years, the S&P was up more than 10%, right? So just because it's an election year does not have an immediate inference on markets. Now, the opposite markets and elections, there actually is a pretty interesting uh, inference there. So since 1932, there's been 16 re-elections, six of which had a recession in the previous two years, 10 of which did not. So of the 10 pres sitting presidents seeking re-election that did not have a recession, nine were re-elected. Of the six that were seeking re-election and a recession did occur, only one was re-elected. So the market and the economy ends up telling us more about elections than elections end up telling us about the market. Now, that's not to say elections aren't important. We understand they are. They're an important driver of policy and things well beyond the economy and other social issues. But when it comes to a trading pattern, just because we're in a four-year election cycle, we don't think that that's particularly robust. Uh, we realize we're close on time, so I think we have one question we're going to try to get to here. Um, so we have some strategists have argued that small caps today are lower in quality, fewer profitable companies, higher leverage levels. Uh, as this continues on and uh, limited IPOs. How does that impact your overall small cap return analysis? That's exactly right. And that is a great question. About a third of the small cap index today is actually unprofitable. 
Um, so it is, uh, you know, companies that have that do not have positive earnings. In spite of that, the lower quality of the index today, what we're just simply looking at when we're talking about the beta of the index is it still, in spite of that, is still attractive. Now, within that, we would very much advocate for being an active investor in small cap. Uh, for a whole host of reasons, most of which we don't have the time to delve into here, but one of them being what uh, the question was asked is exactly right, is that the index itself is lower quality today. So even with that foundation of being lower quality, it's still attractive. And then beyond that, we think there's an opportunity to outperform and frankly, thoughtfully manage that risk through active management. Now, I know we're right up on time. We want to respect your time and appreciate that it is, uh, it's a very valuable asset. So we want to thank you uh, for your uh, attention and time here. If you have any questions that we didn't get to, please feel free to follow up or with your consultant. You can also see a portion of our website, the insight section, where we'll be posting these materials. Uh, and again, thank you so much for joining us. Have a great rest of your day.